Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marta Palmeira and I welcome you to the co-talks, conservation talks during quarantine times. This will be our last talk from this season uh, and we will get back to our studio after two months and a half um, at home. So, and we will rethink about the co-talks in the future. So if you have any suggestion, you are welcome to talk to us. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Caitlin, for accepting to be our 10th guest in this co-talks. Uh, we don't know each other personally, but we know uh, SIC, Sustainability and Conservation, and uh, I am thrilled to have you today because it's a great concern uh, of, uh, of us in our studio and we hope that sustainability is also a concern for all the conservators here. Um, so thank you very much, Caitlin. We know that you are fully occupied with your, with your webinars and uh, you made it today. So can you make a short introduction of yourself and how did SIC begin? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marta, and thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Um, so my name is Caitlin Southwick, and I am the founder and executive director of Sustainability and Conservation. Um, SIC started years ago, four years ago now, uh, when I was a master's student. And I, I have always been very passionate about the environment in my personal life, but I never really translated that into what it means to be sustainable as a conservator. And I was walking by the trash can in our studio one day and I looked inside and it was full of disposable nitrile gloves. And I thought, well, that's quite wasteful. Isn't there something we can do about that? Uh, so I asked around and no one knew. So I started doing some research and I found that indeed there are a lot of things that we can do. Um, but the information was scattered and difficult to find and there wasn't really a streamlined way for conservators to find access to resources or to communicate about sustainable initiatives. So I began sustainability and conservation in order to try and fill that gap and unite us as a sector in making our profession greener. Okay, thank you very much for being so short. So I will go back to the gloves because it was how this started <laughs> because I have a lot of questions for you uh, with this in this subject. So after testing the gloves that uh, you recommend in the SIC website, uh, which brand do you prefer? And are they all available in Europe? That's a good question. Um, I, don't, I would not say that I have a preference. Um, there are three types of gloves that we currently um, showcase on the SIC website. One is that it's actually not specifically related to the type of glove, but more related to the sustainability aspects. So for example, Kimberly Clark has a recycling program specifically for their gloves called the Right Cycle Program, uh, which is available in Europe. Uh, TerraCycle uh, has a recycling program that works with any type of gloves. So any disposable nitrile gloves can be recycled through TerraCycle. And then Showa Best is the last one, and that's actually a glove that is biodegradable. Um, all of these programs are available in Europe, but it does depend on the country. So for example, I know that Showa Best is, um, has not been available in Portugal, but they will be soon. And then TerraCycle is uh, available in some countries, not others, and same with the Kimberly Clark program. So it's, it's more countrywide than, uh, than continent-wide. Okay, okay. And uh, regarding the, the, the gloves, uh, let me see here. It's can can we discard the gloves and recycle them equally? The ones that have chemicals or have been touched in chemicals, and that and the others that uh, haven't. It depends on the recycling program, so it can be a little bit tricky. But bottom line is that in in our conservation practice, it's fine to recycle all okay. of the gloves. There's uh, usually what these men, these recycling facilities are looking for are biohazards. We don't have those. Okay. So from, from my knowledge, they're all able to be recycled. Okay, good. That's, that's, that's a very good question. So another one fits from another participant that she asked your opinion about bamboo gloves. 
Do you know them? Are there a good alternative to the nitrile gloves? Thank you. I actually had not heard of them before, mm -hmm. so I was really excited to see that and um, also to see that they've been uh, tested already in conservation was my impression. So yeah. um, to the participant, please let us know. I'd love to hear more. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that, you know, obviously cotton gloves have some issues to them. So this sounds like a really exciting alternative. Okay, so I will also search about that. And do you think uh, conservators are aware of sustainability in their studios, in the museums, in universities? Do, do they care enough to start changing uh, their habits? Um, in the four years uh, since you created SIC, uh, were you able to find changes in some institutions? I think that one of the most beautiful things about our profession is that we do care. Uh, conservation is inherent in what we do. It's part of our job and that includes the planet. And um, I cannot tell you how humbling and overwhelming it has been to see the type of support that uh, we have received at SIC and really the demand for what we're doing. Um, I think that as far as being aware of it, I think that since it's not in our training programs, it's not something that we think about uh, perhaps right away, but I do think that as the issue becomes more and more prevalent, more and more conservators are starting to want to want to be sustainable in their practices. So it's it's been absolutely incredible um, how fast we've grown and how how much demand there is for what we do. And I have seen a, a lot of change, absolutely um, incredibly positive change and continued interest and continued research and continued growth in our sector. And is it easier on uh, public institutions or uh, on private ones? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess I guess it really depends. I'm not quite sure. I, I think that you know, if you uh, private institutions, you know, the the conservators might have a little bit more control over certain aspects, whereas public institutions sometimes there's a little bit more bureaucracy, so it might be more difficult to implement change. But I think it also uh, it starts with the individual, and it starts with you know the conservator, and if they're interested in making changes, then they're able to, they're able to do it at any level in any institution. And it's available to, to do those changes. Um, in a private uh, studio, they can afford uh, those changes easily, more or less. I yeah, I think that this is a common misconception. A lot of people think that sustainability means having to spend a lot of money in order to make big changes, but that's not the case. And actually in a lot of circumstances, being more sustainable will save you money. Um, either because, yeah, exactly. So it's while, you know, uh, if you think about large scale changes like having to update your HVAC system or something like that, that's obviously um, a large investment. But there are plenty of things that you can do that are either free or will save you money that um, can make sustainability accessible to everyone on any budget. Okay, and don't you think that the, the best way would be to, to change the conservator habits during university, like to teach a lecture or something so they can be aware before uh, starting uh, working? I could not agree with you more. Absolutely. It is imperative that we start integrating sustainability into our training programs. Uh, we have been trying to do that with the, with the student ambassador program at SIC, which empowers students to really start uh, thinking about sustainability while they're at their universities or in their training programs. Um, it is difficult. And I think you know, I, I teach courses at some universities on sustainability, but um, right now, since it's not part of the curriculum, and as I'm sure all of you are aware, we're all very strapped for time and resources, and most universities at this point feel that they don't have room in their curriculum for sustainability, which I think is a real shame, and I'm really hoping that we start changing that. And there are a couple of universities that have um, that have really engaged with sustainable practices. Uh, the University of Vienna, I taught a course there a couple of weeks ago. They are really pushing sustainability for their students. Um, the UCLA Getty program, I will be teaching a course there this summer. They're really um, implementing sustainability. 
Uh, there's a professor at Queen's University in Canada that integrates sustainability into all aspects of her teaching. So there are some universities that are starting to make this uh, transition to including sustainability, but I think it's absolutely imperative that we start at the training level completely. Okay, that's, that's great to know that a lot of the universities are already doing it. Yeah, uh, it is. And do you think it's, uh, how, how could they do more? Um, in the universities that they don't have a lecture, uh, how can do they uh, put the conscious in their students with conferences, webinars, mandatory courses? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that they're, you know, obviously the best way to communicate sustainability is by communicating about it, talking about it. So the more academic publications, the more resources, just knowing where to find things is very important. Um, but this, this whole question is, is basically our goal at SIC. How do we get the information to people so mm -hmm. they can make changes? Um, I think, you know, how, teaching courses, the webinars we've been putting on have been incredibly popular. Um, you know, just having having resources and access to resources, and you know, hopefully SIC will be able to help help solve these solve these issues. But okay. definitely more research, more conferences, more publications, just okay. as much as we can. Okay, thanks. So re regarding working in a museum, it's uh, really exasperating to see the amount of plastic that is used um, to pack the artworks, to store them, to encapsulate them. Are there already alternatives to the foams, to the mylars, to the boxes that we use? And uh, how many times can, you, can we use the same packaging before uh, put it to recycle? That's a good question. Um, and I think one of the biggest concerns right now is sustainable packaging and shipping um, aspects. There are some crates, crate systems that are fully reusable. Um, there's a crate called the Turtle, yeah, which is a, yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And, um, you know, fully reusable, fully sustainable. The same crates that were built 20 years ago are still in use. Um, so there's, there's options like that. Unfortunately, at the moment, there are not alternatives to, you know, if we're building your own crates, there are not alternatives to the foams and the mylars that we mm -hmm. use. Um, however, I think, you know, in, in terms of reuse, I think it's common sense. I think it also depends on the type of object that you're, that you're using. Um, I've never had anyone tell me that they've had negative experiences when reusing plastics um, or foams. I think that obviously as conservators, we tend to be a little bit uh, conservative about those types of things. Um, but we are trying to do, trying to now start doing more research into sustainable alternatives for these phones. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have a more concrete answer and solution for everyone. But right now let's try to reuse as much as we can. Okay. And do you consider that a preventive conservation in medium and long term is the most effective way to be sustainable? And uh, if so, do you think it has been clearly and effectively promoted? I think that's a great question. <laughs> um, I know a lot of people who firmly believe that. Um, I think that I, I guess for me, it also depends on how we're conducting our preventive conservation. Are we doing it in a way that is actually effective for the objects and is necessary? Um, there's a lot of discussion right now about climate control conditions and, you know, adapting greener protocols such as the BEZO protocol as opposed to having very, very rigid, stringent conditions. Um, I, I certainly think that preventive conservation is hugely important for maintaining our collections but i also think that it's incredibly important that we do it in a way that is sustainable um because you know if we start saying that the only way to be sustainable long term is preventive conservation so we have to have these really strict conditions that's also that's also not sustainable mm -hmm. so it's just it's really about using our brains and which we're very good at as conservators so it's, uh, you know, common sense applications, I think. Yeah, I think in, the, in, this, uh, in this question, the, the preventive conservation is avoiding uh, doing uh, restoration itself in the, the pieces. Uh, so we, we are not, we, if we don't do it, we don't uh, use uh, more materials, we don't use solvents. So I think, I think that was the point uh, with this question, but I'm not sure. Yeah. 
So. No, I, I think that I think that makes sense. I mean, I've I've heard this argument several times as well. If you know, the most sustainable treatment is one that you don't. I'm on, I'm on mute. No, no. There no. we go. Okay, yeah. we're back. <laughs> um, I, I think that, you know, the, it's obviously, if we can, you know, the less interventions we have on an object, the better, because of course, you know, it's also damaging to the object every time we, we interfere. But I think, um, so yes, I think yes, if it's done in, if it's done, if preventive conservation is done in a sustainable way, it's obviously, um, going to be something that's much more beneficial. Yeah, I have uh, here one participant saying that sadly in some museums I heard that the problems with reusing crates, stands and others in storage, uh, they rethink it's more uh, time consuming and expensive than uh, changing for new ones. So I think mm. it's a mindset that has to be changed uh, before. Yeah, something. absolutely. And I think I've also seen some institutions that, um, you know, they don't have space to store crates. Yeah. So they just throw them away because there's no place to put them. Um, the, the, the turtle program, I think, is really interesting because you can actually, you rent the crates instead of buying them so you don't have to store them yourself. They will come and pick them up when mm -hmm. they're done being used. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I agree with you. I think it's a mindset thing. And I think that we just have to get in habits of reuse rather than um, throwing away. Mm -hmm. And the, the the participant that asked about the bamboo gloves, she's saying that yeah. it were, that they were recommended by a Swedish museum to replace the disposable oh, gloves. So, and she has oh, the terrific. link here, so everyone can uh, check the the brands of the gloves. So, thank you very much. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Now, in uh, now, I have some more practical questions from participants. So most of the time, most of the time, conservators don't know the proper way to dispose chemicals and cottons that were used for cleaning. How can we know what should be left to evaporate, discard separately, or put in the normal trash? That's a great question. And unfortunately, there is no blanket answer for this. Um, I also have done a lot of uh, discussions on proper disposal of solvents because that is such a complicated issue and you know I I've seen conservators just throw acetone down the drain and obviously that's very pollutive mm -hmm. um, the unfortunately the the real answer to this question is it depends on where you are geographically so in different cities they have different um, rules and regulations for disposal and i think that the best the best way to get your answer is to visit your local waste uh processing facility and talk with the ma waste management um, um experts and ask them and just say you know we have all of this cotton that we use it's you know a cotton blend so it's got some polyester in it uh but we use it with solvents is that still something that we should throw away does that need to be in the hazardous waste and find out um, cause it's, it's very difficult, but what we're doing at SIC, cause this is such a big issue is we're creating a, um, waste facilities, uh, questionnaire. So, uh, conservators can download the form and then take the form with them to their, their waste processing center and know what kind of questions that they should start asking so they can mm -hmm. find out, you know, what information is needed. And, um, what we're going to try and do with that is then compile all of that information online so that conservators can look online and see, okay, in my area, these are the rules and regulations, this is the proper way to do it. We're also working on developing a course on basically cleaning tools and, and solvent disposal and what, what kind of good housekeeping tips we can, we can provide that are more general. Okay, so no solution for the cottons full uh, of uh, solvents. <laughs> Unfortunately, it depends on where you are. Unfortunately, it depends on where you are. So it, in some places, those can actually be recycled. So it's, it's important, yeah, because, because of the plastic within the cotton. And once the solvent evaporates, it's just the plastic and cotton left. So it actually can be recycled. But um, that's not true in all places. So once again, it's it's unfortunately a little bit tricky to uh, to to say blanketly which what you can do with them. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> I wish I had a clearer answer. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to know that we have to do our part also. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, but we're helping you in any way we can. 
<laughs> yeah, okay, thank you. So, do industrial film huts have an internal filters to absorb the gases they extract? And uh, if yes, do you, uh, how do we know if it, ha it has re reached the limit of uh, fumes and gases and solvents? That's a great question. And unfortunately, once again, it depends completely on the on the machine and the equipment. So every fume hood works a little bit differently. So you'd have to check with the manufacturer. Um, but once again, I think that's something that we're working on at SIC to kind of compile information about the types of equipment we might see in our studio and what best practices will be for those equipment um, uh, maintenance and and what the sustainability aspects are so this is something we're still busy with collecting information and if anyone would like to either contribute or has ideas and thoughts or more questions we're very we're, we welcome all input how many volunteers, I, I assume, that are working on uh, SIC at the moment? Uh, we have almost 30, I think, right now, worldwide. Okay, because you are, you are talking about uh, such different uh, areas uh, to cover, so... Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a lot, but we've got an incredible team and we've, we're growing every day, so it's really exciting. That's amazing. Uh, let me see. So I, I heard your webinar two weeks ago and also this week and uh, you spoke about the dangers in agar and uh, I was really worried because we are, we are using it a lot because we thought it was really sustainable, uh, free of solvents, uh, but then I was, okay, what, sh what should we do? Um, I would like to know what what should we avoid when buying it? Because uh, if I realize it was a question of provenance on the on the agar. Yeah, and I, I apologize if it came off as um, a, a dangerous because I I love agar. I use it all the time in my own practice. I highly recommend it and encourage it. It's a miracle for so many treatments, and it's really it is sustainable. It's a great tool and it's a great material to use. Um, it is, there is some discussion though that it's being, that it's endangered because the gummy bear industry just uses too much of it. So um, it is just a matter of it being sustainably sourced um, and just really being aware of how, like just once again, this goes back to everything, just being conscientious about it, being aware of it and being mindful about how much you're using. So, you know, if it's possible, like don't, don't throw it away unnecessarily. Don't waste it. Um, you know, even though it's not toxic, you do have to think about where it comes from. And the fact is, is that this is something that is um, not as prevalently available as we would like it to be. So please, by all means, keep using agar. It's a wonderful, wonderful material. Just be aware of, you know, don't waste. <laughs> but can we put it in the, in the normal trash after use? Yes, um, because it's biodegradable, it's, it's fine to be put in the normal trash. I actually, I used to do uh, something where I would take some, either some cotton or paper towels and I would actually wipe my agar off um, if I did it in like a rigid gel form and then reuse it. So we know with agar, you can reuse it a few times until it's too dirty. But mm -hmm. um, so that's also, you know, once again, the mindfulness and mitigating waste. Is yeah, we, we use it um, till it gets uh, yellow or I don't know. It's getting yeah, really exactly dirty. until it's so brown you can't see it. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, we have a participant asking which countries is SIC covering? All of them. Um, so SIC is completely international. We work with um, conservators in Africa, in South America, all over Europe, in Australia, the United States, Canada, everywhere. <laughs> Um, Asia, of course. Um, we are starting to branch out and have actually what we're calling uh, regional branches. So um, in order to really address issues that are more local and um, in order to create local networks and also to help with uh, language barriers. So we have uh, SIC Portugal, we also have SIC Italia, and just recently we are about to launch SIC Polska, so in, uh, in uh, Poland. And, um, you know, if there's anyone who's interested in having a regional branch, let us know and we'll see what we can do. Um, but very much international. We work with all of the international organizations, um, IIC, ICOMCC, AIC, AICCM, all the, 
all the uh, <laughs> various acronyms. So we very much a global perspective because we really want to help unite the sector on a global scale to share the research and um, and to and to facilitate making our profession more sustainable. Great. So uh, it's also another question: Can you dispose agar as a compost for plants? Um, I think. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on on the treatment and if you have you know solvents and also what you're removing. So um, I, I, to be honest, I don't see why not. I don't know that it's. Um, I guess it also depends on what you mean by compost. If it's if like you're going to be taking it to you know, if the, you, your city, for example, has compost collection and you want to dispose it in there, the easiest answer is ask your waste facilities manager. Um, there was a story I heard from a museum in California where they had uh, the biodegradable bioplastic cups that they were using at one of their events. And then they went to their local waste facilities management um, or processing plant and they found out that because even though these cups are compostable because they have no nutritious value and the compost is actually then sold to agricultural um, where, mm -hmm. wares and farmers, they actually don't compost them, they throw them away. So it's actually more sustainable to use plastic ones that can be recycled. So it's this huge issue, but the, the um, so if you're gonna be composting something, just go to your waste processing center and find out if that's a good way to do it. Um, they'll have they'll have the clear answers. If you want to put it in your backyard, I'd say go for it. <laughs> so I was really curious about the treatments that you referred in the, in the webinar done in the Vatican sculptures. Oh yes, uh, with the essential oils to clean. It were there uh, stone sculptures? Yes, they yeah. were stone. I'm a marble. I'm a stone conservator. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so can you share the name of the product that was used to clean all of those sculptures? And also, the uh, is there a publication uh, that people can see with the authors? And if you can share it. Yes, absolutely. Um, this will all be going up on our resource center, which will be launching uh, later this year on SIC. So we'll have all the information there. Um, and I do apologize. I was going to have a slide on it. And for some reason that fell through the cracks. But the product is called Biotersis, B-I-O-T-E-R-S-U-S. Um, I'd be happy, um, Marta, if you'd like, I can send the link to you and you can distribute it to the participants. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's a fantastic product. Um, they've been using it at the Vatican for 10 years. They cleaned all of the sculptures in the entire, like all of the Pope's gardens with this product and it's been incredibly successful. Um, they're now testing for preventive aspects of it to see if they can combine it with a funori to make a kind of a coating that then prevents biological contamination from returning. So it's got a lot of really, really exciting um, implications for, for, the, for the project. Um, it's great, we are using biocids and if we can use a, a, an essential oil, it's uh, wonderful. So yeah, to, yeah everyone, exactly. everyone should know totally about, about that. It's, uh, exactly, and that's, that's what we're trying to do. And uh, to answer the first part of the question, the publications, there are publications, but they're all in Italian, mm -hmm. which is why we're trying to get basically permission to republish them in, in either in English or a summary in English. Um, but of course, you can, you can always use Google Translate as well. So I will also send the links to the publications to you, Martha. Just for curiosity, are the, the people that uh, developed that are conservators in Vatican or yes. just curious people? It started. No, it was it was um, the the head of the stone and uh, plaster uh, department, Guy Devereux, um, kind of initiated this. He worked with his the head of the science department. He brought in external researchers and external analysts and scientists. And it, there was a team of about I think five people that really came up with it. And then they started using it um, within the within the Vatican and have had a lot of success. That's uh, great. Uh, I will check about it. Please send us yes. the, the, yes, the link. Yes, I absolutely will. It's and fantastic. The, yeah. and, and another question was also about the essential oils used in the, to prevent infestations. Are there researches about that? There have been a few researches about that, yes. And once again, that will be something that will be um, included in our resource center. Um, so 
I, I, from, from what I know is that basically this has been tested in a couple of places with some success. It does seem to me that there's more testing needed um, for this particular, for this particular um, application, but it sounds, it seems very, very promising. So the, the literature references and description of, of the treatment will all be included in our D-Tree, which will be launching, as I said, later this year. But it's, it's the same team in Vatican that is doing this? No, um, no, no. I, I don't think that the Vatican, this, this is a different uh, blend of essential oils and it's a different product. Okay. Um, so from, what, from, my, from my knowledge, the best of my knowledge, they have not implemented that particular application at the Vatican. Okay, okay. Uh, with regards to sustainability, whether to impact accessibility or uniqueness, can you classify which are the three top solutions developed and available so far and that everyone should know uh, and put into practice uh, tomorrow? Um, well, the first and most important thing to be more sustainable is to talk about it. That's always the number one thing I tell everybody, just talk about it, being aware, building awareness, bringing it into conversation. That is the first and most important step in practicing sustainably is, is, is just to uh, communicate about it. Um, I'd say for like quick and dirty tricks, um, you know, one of the, one of the big issues is, is fume hoods and, um, and energy consumption. Uh, every time I walk into a conservation studio, the first thing I tell conservators is keep your fume hood shut because that saves a ton of energy. Um, also, you know, just being conscientious about turning off your equipment. I think we covered some of these things in the webinar for SIC. Um, and I think that, so that would be like the first two. And the third one, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really just, I don't know if it would be, it, there's like one specific thing, but just, you know, being conscientious, mitigating your waste, being aware of the waste you're producing and being aware of what sustainability means in terms of, in terms of what your practice is. So just educating yourself. And, and what about products or sol or green solvents or <laughs> what, are, what are the top three? Um, well, let's see the top three most sustainable treatments. Um, well, I love the bioterrasis, the um, the essential oils. I think that's phenomenal. Of course, I'm a stone conservator, so that's. And you, you have already used it. Uh, yes, I used yeah. it uh, when I was. I worked at the Vatican last year, and I, I okay. used it there, and it's fantastic, and it smells de delicious. <laughs> um, so that's a really wonderful one to use. Um, there is, let's see, there's a couple of products that have come out but have been taken off the market, including a sulfur-reducing bacteria. I think in terms of green solvents, one of the good things that we can celebrate is we actually already use a lot of green solvents. That's nice. Um, you know, acetone and ethanol are actually quite uh, green compared to a lot of the things we used to use. Um, I guess one of the other things maybe would be that, um, just to know that emulsions are better than gels. So if you can use an emulsion as opposed to a gel, that's great. And if you're going to use a gel, try and use a hydrogel. Um, agar is fantastic. I love it. Use it all the time. Um, and I, I would say maybe just try to lean more towards natural materials rather than synthetic materials. So I hope I, that's helpful. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I have a, a last question for you. Uh, if today you had the opportunity to solve the three, the three biggest sustainability problems in the conservation world, uh, which would you choose? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, I would say the first one would be the education aspect. We need to be implementing sustainability into our training so that we can start thinking about it from the get-go. Um, that's that, and you know, just communicating about it. That's a big one. Um, I would say the, the other one is probably the um, climate control aspects. So, you know, kind of figuring out what that magic way to be, to practice preventive conservation without, you know, destroying the planet would be fantastic. Um, and then I think probably the, the, the uh, packaging and shipping aspects. So, you know, finding our miracle, reusable, fully sustainable creating system that can be used by everyone and that is used by everyone and putting circular models into there as well. I think that's, those are probably the three biggest ones. Okay, so thank you very much. I don't know if you want to explain really shortly uh, what are the, the next steps for SIC uh, 
in, I don't know if you, you can, you are doing, you have one, one more webinar, right? In yeah. this, uh, and then you go, uh, you go to, to your work normally after the quarantine. Uh, what are you expecting for the future? Um, well, so SIC is now my full-time job. Um, I, I, I kind of put down my, my conservation tools and I'm just doing sustainability full-time. So this is actually kind of normal for me. Um, but we have a lot of really exciting things at SIC because we're now a fully dedicated team that is just working on sustainability. We have the capacity to make a lot of new projects. Um, I mentioned a couple times our resource center, which we're putting together. This is going to be a big one um, coming up in the next couple of months here where we're compiling all of the resources and information about sustainability in conservation. So it'll have case studies, literature, resources, and we're creating a ghee tree, which is basically going to be a decision-making chart for conservators to start um, figuring out what more sustainable alternatives are going to be. Um, we're developing research projects, including more research into green solvents and into gels. So we're creating handbooks on, you know, what evaluating what the sustainability aspects of each of these are, and then how we can um, turn mm -hmm. that into, you know, how we can make better, better choices. Um, and then also include case studies in there. And another really exciting announcement is that we're going to be uh, creating an academic journal. So we have, uh, we're going to be I've been in conversation with publishers and we'll be creating an academic journal for uh, publications on sustainability. And uh, of course, we would like to increase our student ambassador program and, and get that implemented everywhere. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Just a few yeah. of the things. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> great and uh, I think we will keep in touch uh, from now on. And uh, I Absolutely. hope all the conservators that are here, uh, if you can tr turn on your camera so we can say goodbye to Caitlin. And thank you very much to all for being with us in the last uh, half, uh, one and a half months in this co-talks. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed all of them. Uh, thank you very much to all. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Uh, if you have thank suggestions you. for co-talks in the future, please send us. So thank you very much to all. And thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And be safe. Thank you. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank you so much.